Welcome to On The Money Line, a podcast by MMA Play 365. I'm Newsom, and I'm here to give you the breakdowns and predictions for this weekend's event at UFC Vegas 57. But as always, just before we get into those breakdowns, there'll be another Bayes AI recap from last weekend at UFC Austin in Texas. And honestly, the Bayes AI is absolutely flying right now, 77% on straight predictions last weekend, 82% the week before, 72% the week before that. So make sure you check out that Bayes AI recap, which will be in its own Bayes AI playlist on our MMA Play 365 YouTube channel. But straight into the breakdowns, that's why you're all here. In the main event, we've got a phenomenal fight in the lightweight division. I think this could potentially be one of the best fights of the entire year. And I mean that from a post-fight perspective. I think this fight is going to be absolutely phenomenal. We're going to see a bit of everything. And I think it's going to be one that we're still talking about come the end of the year when we're looking at the end of the year awards and everything like that. We've got Armin Sarukian versus Mateus Gamrot. And like I said, this is a phenomenal fight. Both fighters, striking-wise, they're very, very even. I don't think there's much of an edge. Sarukin's more of a technical striker, whereas Gamrot's more of a powerful striker. So from that perspective, I, I don't feel that there's really too much edge in the striking. But I actually think that this fight's going to be won and lost on the mat, the wrestling and the grappling. And again, I feel like the wrestling's quite even. You know, Gamrot's got really good takedowns himself. He'll look for an ankle pick. He'll dive straight in at the ankle, even if he's a little bit too far out from for a, an entry into a takedown. So he'll make the most of what he's got. Armin Sarukin's also got really good takedowns, good single leg good single leg takedowns, good double leg takedowns. And like I say, Mateus Gamrot's wrestling's good also. And then once the fight hits the mat, we're going to be looking at who's the better grappler. And once again, I just don't think there's a massive edge here. If we are looking at a specific edge from the grappling perspective, then I would side it with Gamrot ever so slightly. Gamrot's an ADCC grappling tournament entrant. He regularly competes in grappling tournaments, ADCC competent as well. So I think that that type of grappling, and we've seen that as well in the UFC in his last fight against Diego Ferreira, Mateus Gamrot was just all over him on the mat. Yes, Fajeda was making his way back up to his feet, but Gamrot was looking comfortable and he wasn't phased with the fact that Fajeda's a third-degree Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. So from a jiu-jitsu perspective, I think Gamrot can mix in there with the best. I think, uh, like I said, his grappling is going to have a maybe a very slight advantage over the grappling of Armin Sarukin. Sarukin tends to just find a position on the mat he's comfortable with and settle in that position, do a little bit of work so the referee you know, isn't tempted to stand them back Back up, but Gamrot is active on the mat. He's actively working, actively looking to gain a better position, a more advantageous position, and also actively looking for submissions as well. The dude's a problem on the mat, and I don't think he's going to run through Armin Sarukin at all. Sarukin's a world-class fighter himself, but I just think it's going to be a phenomenal fight. I think from a striking perspective, we're going to see the patient technique from Sarukian against the aggressive, powerful strikes from Gamrot. And I don't think Gamrot's specifically a knockout threat. I just feel he's the more powerful striker out of the two. Then when it comes to the wrestling, I think both fighters are going to be one of are going to want to be in a top position because I feel that both fighters are going to expect the takedowns from the other side. So they'll try and get there first before their opponent starts running with the takedowns. And that's why I think we're going to see a lot of action on the mat here because whilst they're both striking, whoever gets top side, I think is going to have the, the better control, the better positioning. And I just feel that even though we're going to see takedowns from both sides, I think both fighters are going to give up takedowns. I just trust that scrambling ability, the grappling ability and the grappling experience and the fact that Gamrot just doesn't settle and doesn't stop on the mat and he's a workhorse throughout those positions on the mat as well. And that's the side I have to edge you with in this fight. So I'm picking Mateus Gamrot to win this fight. And in the co-main event, we've got Neil Magny versus Shavkat Rachmonov. And I think this is a difficult fight for Neil Magny now. Obviously, Shavkat Rachmonov's a big favourite in this spot. And I feel like a lot of people are going to look at the line on Neil Magny and feel that there's a lot of value there, especially with, with him being a big underdog and, you know, taking that shot at Neil Magny potentially winning the fight. And although I don't think it's 
a terrible, would be a terrible shot at that sort of line on someone like Neil Magny, who is a veteran, who is so well-rounded. I just kind of get the feeling that it's going to be one of those underdogs that looks so juicy that you can't pass up that ultimately ends up losing. And the reason why I think that Neil Magny is going to lose is Shavkat Ratmonov, for as well-rounded as Neil Magny is, Shavkat Ratmonov is also well-rounded. He's a good striker. He's quick. He throws combinations. He can fight in either stance. He'll mix in kicks with his punches. He'll throw, like I said, good volume in those combinations as well. But then he's got good wrestling. He's got good grappling. He's got good submissions. Shavkat Ratmonov can just do it all. And I do believe that he could be a serious competitor in this division, especially moving forwards. You know, in 12, 18 months time, we could be looking at Ratmonov being in that top five, discussing him for title implications and title shots. I feel like he's that type of fighter with that type of ceiling because not only is he so skilled from a quality perspective of a fighter, but he's also got that killer instinct as well to find that knockout or to find that submission, which I think is going to separate him from the pack especially where he is right now in the division. So I think that Neil Magny is going to have moments in this fight. I think that Magny is going to be able to get off on a jab. I think he's going to be able to land some strikes on Rachmonov. But unless he is seriously hurting Rachmonov and getting his utmost respect from the moment the fight starts, Rachmonov's going to come forward. He's going to take what you've got and he's going to make reads and see where he's going to be able to have the most success because like I said, he's that well-rounded. He can come into a fight with a game plan of, right, I'm going to strike and I'm confident I'm a better striker. But if that doesn't work out or if he feels that there's an easier path to victory with the wrestling and grappling, then he's got the capabilities there as well. I just feel like it's a difficult fight for Neil Magny, even though he's going to have his moments. I just don't see him getting his hand raised at the end of the night. So for that reason, I'm picking Shavkat Rakmonov to win this fight. And in the next fight, in the heavyweight division, we've got Josh Parisian versus Alan Bordeaux. Now, I don't mean any disrespect for, from a UFC quality fight. I do feel like this is a low-level heavyweight fight in the UFC. I think both fighters are absolutely in need of a win. I think the loser here is more than likely going to be sent his walking papers, unfortunately. You know, I never like to see any fighter lose the job, but that's just the situation that both fighters are in, I think. So... This is an important fight for, for either fighter, for both fighters, because they've got to be able to get the job done to not just get a win on the board, but to also potentially save the UFC career as well. Now, I feel like Alan Bordeaux is slightly favoured in this fight. I think that from a striking perspective, everything's going to be close here. But one of the reasons why I quite like Alan Bordeaux in this fight is because Bordeaux's downfall seems to be when he's taken down and he's flat on his back and he can't move unless he is just against a much better quality striker which i don't think josh parisian is that much better quality striker i think the striking is going to be quite close and because alan bordeaux not having to deal with a fighter predominantly who's going to be trying to wrestle wrestle heavily and take him down i think bordeaux is going to feel more comfortable in this fight and i think that's quite important because once he starts feeling his feet once he starts being a little bit more comfortable we have seen some decent moments of him in fights where he has looked good but then bang he'll get taken down and suddenly you know everything's flipped on it on its head from an alan bordeaux fight perspective so with just parisian Josh Parisian's going to have a good first round. He normally does, but then he normally starts falling off the cliff a little bit in regards to the gas tank and the cardio, and then it becomes a little bit of a slugfest. And this is where I think Alan Bordeaux is going to look good in this fight. I think he could potentially drop round one, and I think he could potentially start taking over the fight the longer the fight goes on. Like I said, he's going to have a fight where he's not worried too much about that wrestling defense and being taken down, which should allow him to flourish a little bit more in this fight than he's been able to in previous fights. So for that reason... I am going to side with Alan Bordeaux. I'm picking Alan Bordeaux to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Thiago Moises versus Christos Iagos. And again, I think it's a difficult fight for Christos Iagos. Thiago Moises is now a proven commodity in the UFC, in my opinion. Sure, his ceiling's probably not going to be that top five, that top ten fighter. But he is a fighter that I do believe is going to beat these types of fighters like Christos Iagos, who's not a bad fighter himself. He's a UFC veteran, two-time UFC fighter as well. So I feel that even though Christos Iagos isn't a bad fighter, Thiago Moises is just going to beat the fighters in and around this talent of pool where Christos Iagos is around. 
And I think that Thiago Moises is going to be the slightly better striker. I think from a wrestling perspective, Iagos might actually be the better wrestler here. But the problem Iagos has when he wrestles heavily is he normally tires himself out. His gas tank is something that is a little untrustworthy. But the other side to that is if he starts taking Thiago Moises down, the biggest gap in skill in this fight is on the mat in the world of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, where Thiago Moises is a black belt and he's just going to be head and shoulders above where Christos Iagos is at. So Iagos is best quality in this fight style versus style is the wrestling but the wrestling is just going to put him into the wheelhouse of where he's completely outmatched so I think it's a difficult fight for Christos Iagos I feel like it's a fight that potentially could more or less be won and lost in the striking department because Moises is a little falls a little short on the wrestling but Iagos isn't going to want to force the wrestling because of the grappling I feel like we're going to see a lot of action on the feet and I think Moises is a, is a good technical striker with a cardio edge as well so for those reasons I'm picking Tiago Moises to win this fight and in the next fight we've got Umar Namagomedov versus Nate Maness now props to Nate Maness and also props to any fighter that's accepting a fight with Umar Namagomedov and actually sees it through you know we haven't got to fight night yet you know there might be an injury or there might be something that, that doesn't go right with the weight or, you know, it could be anything. But any fighter that actually steps in there with Umar Namagomedov, you know, has, has got my utmost respect because Umar Namagomedov, cousins of Habib, he's, he's an absolute phenom. And I think 14-0 is, is on the rise to be the next big thing in the division. Again, I just feel like he's going to run through every single fighter that he's fighting right now until he hits that top two and that top three which I think inevitably he is going to hit and he's a finisher as well he doesn't just lay and pray and look for ground and pound again a lot like Habibi will look for a finish on the mat whether that be through pushing himself and forcing that ground and pound to a TKO or whether that be finding a submission I think that is a real problem Nate Maness is gonna you know he's he's not a bad fighter I just feel that he's going to struggle everywhere in this fight. Like, I don't think he's the better striker. He's certainly not the better wrestler, and he's not the better grappler either. And unless he just does catch Umar Namagomedov early, which is possible with any UFC caliber fighter that's putting on four rounds MMA gloves, that knockout, that flash knockout, it's a, it's a puncher's chance that's it's always got a likelihood of happening, but again, it's just a low percentage outcome. I think Umar Namagomedov's going to control the fight from the get-go. I think he's going to be able to ultimately do whatever he wants, whether he wants to strike or whether he just does want to take the easier path to victory, take the fight down to the mat and look to finish Nate Maynus. Props to Nate Maynus for taking this fight. I'm sure the UFC are appreciating everybody that is stepping in the cage with Umar Namagomedov because he's a fighter that I'd imagine a lot of fighters just don't want to fight for obvious reasons. But like I said, Umar Namagomedov is uh, just a better fighter everywhere here. It's tough to, to see him losing. So I am picking Umar Namagomedov to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got a clash of styles. We've got Chris Curtis versus Hadolfo Vieira. And like I said, the clash of styles, Chris Curtis, absolutely a boxing heavy fighter, good hands, good power in his hands, good combinations, good cardio. He's also dealt with a lot of wrestlers, had to defensively wrestle quite a little bit in his career. And that's just because of the, the striking quality that he has. And on the other side, like I say, Adolfo Vejeda is a completely different type of fighter. He's absolutely a grappler and he's probably one of the most credentialed BJJ players in the entire world of MMA. You know, he's, he's legitimately a solid grappler. They called him the black belt hunter just because as he was making his way through the belts in jiu-jitsu, he was constantly submitting and beating black belts when he wasn't a black belt himself so that's where he gets that nickname from and that's the type of grappler that you're dealing with now the problem that you've got with Vader though is his cardio is suspect absolutely suspect he's, he's absolutely huge for the division he's a unit I'd probably prefer him to fight at the the weight class above if I'm being honest but obviously he doesn't and uh, that cardio does does get affected now he is weird though because sometimes he can look absolutely gone after round one but sometimes he can look okay for three rounds and, and grab something in the third round which he did last time out so the cardio is just a red flag is what i'm trying to say it's not a huge concern just a bit of a red flag the the real red flag for me here is i'm not sure exactly what surgery it was but adolfo vieda nearly didn't have a career in mma anymore you know something something was wrong maybe some sort of disease or some sort of life or career threatening injury and he had to have surgery and he wasn't sure whether he'd be able to fight again it was one of those surgeries where he had to come out and the doctor had to assess him and tell the doctor basically had to make that decision of whether he can fight again or not so that worries me a little bit but outside of that i do feel that 
Adolfo Vieira can get this fight to the mat. I do think that he's going to be able to find good positions on top of Chris Curtis. And Chris Curtis, for as much as he has defensively wrestled in the past and been able to cope with what's on top of him, I think with a BJJ player like Adolfo Vieira, who is, like I said, elite at what he does, I think Chris Curtis will have problems with Vieira on top of him. And the question you've got to ask yourself is, does Vieira get a takedown? And does he spend a couple of minutes on top of Chris Curtis in this fight? And I do believe the answer to that is yes. And because of that, I just feel that Vieda is going to be able to get him out of there. So I'm picking Hadolfo Vieda to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Tafon Chukwe versus Carlos Ulberg. I think this is going to be a really good fight. Chukwe, I feel like I got away with one last time out. I, I bet against him, against Azamat Mirzakhanov. And obviously Mirzakhanov was getting comfortably beaten until that flying knee that knocked Chukwe out. And... Actually, that's one thing that concerns me, the fact that Chuck Ray has been hurt and he has been knocked out like that and coming back from a knockout like that, you never 100% know. It is a little bit of a cliche just automatically to assume that a fight is not going to be the same after a bad knockout, you know, a good recovery process and, you know, it might never happen again. But it is a slight concern with Carlos Ulberg. <clears throat> he's going to be the taller fighter. He's going to be the longer fighter from a technical perspective. He's the one with the kickboxing background who's got the kickboxing credentials. He's going to be the cleaner striker, the crisper striker. And that's something that Chuck Wei's definitely got to be careful of because he is going to have straight shots coming down the middle. But the thing is, Chuck Wei's dealt with somebody like Carlos Ulberg before, not from a skill set perspective, but the fact that Carlos Ulberg's six foot four, he's going to have a huge height advantage over Chuck Wei. But you go back and look at the fact that Chuck Wei had with Rodriguez and Rodriguez is six foot four as well, and Chuck Wei was getting into that range, blasting combinations, blasting kicks to the body. He was also good in the Muay Thai plum clinch as well, looking for knees, looking for elbows. So the fact that Ulberg six foot four is something that I don't think Chuck Wei is going to be phased about at all because it's something he's dealt with before. And actually, Ulberg's one of these fighters where the cardio is a bit of a question mark as well. In his UFC debut, he came out at 100 miles an hour, gassed himself out badly, got finished by Kennedy and Zechukwu, which for somebody that's supposed to be a world-class kickboxer getting finished by Kennedy and Zechukwu. No disrespect intended there, but the skill set quality should have been absolutely on the side of Ulberg. So for Ulberg to get finished there, definitely not a great look. And then in his last fight against Fabio Charant, who's absolutely a grappler, not a striker, Carlos Ulberg could have gone at that 100 mile an hour again, but he didn't. He slowed down, he was patient, and he did rack up some decent amount of strikes, but he, he was too patient, and the fact that Fabio Charant was backing up a little bit, it just allowed uh, Ulberg to control the, the pace, the range, the distance, all that sort of stuff. But for me here, I don't think Chuck is going to allow that. Chuck Way's a big dude. He's going to be pushing forwards. If Ulberg's starting to be a little bit patient and looking to push Chuck Way back, I think Chuck Way will meet him in the middle. And then if Ulberg comes out at 100 miles an hour, he might get that finish against Chuck Way. But if he doesn't, then I trust Chuck Way's cardio way more. I think that Chuck Way's a little inconsistent with the volume but when he's on and like I said that six foot four fight against Rodriguez that was also a fight that Chuck Way put up a, a hundred plus strikes I think if it's that type of fight I think Chuck Way is actually going to be able to do enough against Carlos Solberg Solberg's either going to be patient which will allow Chuck Way, Chuck Way to come forwards and land on him or Ulberg's going to come at 100 miles an hour Chuck Way's going to have to weather a storm and if he does that then he's going to be a fa he's going to be facing a gassed out Ulberg so I feel that either way you look at this I think Chuck Way's got a good fight ahead of him here he's actually a good technical striker himself he's got power he's got a BJJ background as well so he'll be okay if this fight hits the mat I like Chuck Way in this fight I think he's gonna have just enough to be able to edge the rounds out and just look slightly better in the eyes of the judges should the fight go to a decision and if there is a finish then it could actually happen on either side so you know it wouldn't shock me for Ulberg to knock Chuck Way out but with that being said I'm gonna side with Taf on Chuck Way to win this fight and in the next fight, we've got TJ Brown versus Shailan Nerd and Becker. And I think this is going to be a fun fight from a wrestling and grappling perspective. I think TJ Brown's absolutely the better striker. I think from what we've seen of Nerd and Becker, he's a little, he's not too confident with his striking. He's, he does lack volume and it lacks technique and it just seems to be a big overhand right. So from a striking perspective, I think TJ Brown is actually light years ahead of Nerd and Becker. But I think Nerd and Becker, because of that, I mean, Nerdenbecker comes into every fight looking to wrestle anyway, but if he starts getting teed off on by TJ Brown, it's only going to force that wrestling from him even further, even more than it would normally. So I feel that Nerdenbecker is going to be shooting takedowns in this fight for sure. 
And the only worry I do have with Nerd and Becker is he can sometimes get reversed and swept quite easily when he is in a good top position. But then he also can sweep and reverse himself. And this is why I think it's going to be a fun fight. I think we're going to see a good, some good grappling exchanges. I also like the fact that Nerd and Becker is now moved over to Sanford MMA to train with Henry Hooft and the guys over there. I think that's only going to drive his game on quite a lot. And... I think the working with Shavkat Ratmonov, also why Ratmonov's in camp as well, he's going to have brought his game on quite a lot. TJ Brown, for me, can be a little bit clumsy, make some bad decisions inside the cage. One minute be looking great, and the next minute being a, a guillotine and being finished. So I think that, like I say, there's going to be... Mo, there's holes in both fighters here, but I think with Nerd and Becker being a good wrestler and wanting to force the action with the wrestling because Brown's going to be such a better striker than him, I feel that he's going to give Nerd and Becker advantages. And like I said, I don't completely trust TJ Brown with these grappling moments in regards to making mistakes and putting himself in bad positions. So for those reasons, I am going to side with Shireland Nerd and Becker to win this fight. And in the next fight, this is probably the second best fight on the entire card, obviously, after the main event. We've got Haulian Paiva versus Sergei Morozov. And again, it, like I said, it's a really good fight. Sergei Morozov has been looking absolutely phenomenal lately. Even though he got finished last time out, look, he was caught by a big punch from a powerful striker in Douglas Silva de Andrade. But Douglas Silva de Andrade was getting absolutely smoked in that first round. We haven't seen any fighter really demolish Douglas Silva de Andrade like that the fact that he was able to stay conscious and fight back and then even win the fight is super impressive for me so like I say Sergei Morozov does have something about him for sure he normally can deal with power coming from the other side Kali Taha is a fighter with big power as well and Morozov took his best shots I just feel that Douglas Silva de Andrade just hit Morozov on that button spot that did manage to hurt him and ultimately become the beginning of the end of the fight for him but outside of that, I mean, Haulian Paiva's a good striker. He's technical, he's long, he'll fight at range. And he's well-rounded as well, but I just don't feel like he's got that power to be able to hurt Morozov and sting him badly like Silva de Andrade did or like Kali Taha could. And I feel like Morozov striking's crisp, training American top team as well has brought his game on a lot. So I feel from a striking perspective, as long as Morozov doesn't get stuck on that outside range and can consistently get inside that boxing range and land strikes on Piver, I think he'll be absolutely fine. But then if he starts looking for the takedowns as well, I think he's the better wrestler in this fight. I think he'll be able to score takedowns on Piver. Whether he can keep him down for long periods of time, I'm not too sure. I'm not too confident there, at least not early on. Maybe a little bit later he can have some top control time if the fight does go late. But just mixing in those takedowns, getting Howley and Piver off his flow, off his rhythm, and then getting inside consistently, landing punches and combinations inside that boxing range. I think Morozov's got a good fight here where... He's facing a good opponent, but it's a good opponent where he can bounce back, rebound with, in a good way to also almost make people forget what happened last time out against Douglas Silva de Andrade, which I think would happen if he goes in there and puts on a good performance against Piver. Then I think people will just remember that fight that happened last and Morozov will just go from strength to strength. And sometimes these really world-class fighters do have that one iffy performance in, early in their career that probably wouldn't go that way if they fought you know, a, another 10 times over. And I feel like it's one of those fights and I feel that Morozov is one of those world-class fighters that is going to be able to mix things up inside the cage here and just be able to put on a good performance and look great against another really good opponent in Howley and Piver so I am picking Sergei Morozov to win this fight. And in the next fight, again, this is another fun fight. We've got Cody, Cody Durden versus J.P. Bays. And Cody Durden and J.P. Bays are both really good wrestlers. They both love to grapple as well. Bays is a BJJ black belt. Durden's someone that is so scrappy on top. He's difficult to deal with. Obviously trains with the Lima brothers as well, or he did before moving to ATT Florida. So he's got a good grappling background himself. I feel like this fight is going to be a really, really good fight. And there's, again, there's going to be a mixture of what happens because I'm not sure who's going to be the one engaging in the wrestling, who's going to want the wrestling more. However, I could hazard a guess, and I do believe it will be J.P. Bay's looking to wrestle Durden. But I think Durden's going to be difficult to wrestle. And I think if you take Durden down, he's got good enough grappling to... I'm not saying he's going to be able to sweep reverse and then absolutely run through J.P. Bay's in a top position, but I think he's good enough to get back up to his feet without too, too many issues, if I'm being honest. I don't think J.P. Bay's jiu-jitsu is that good that he's going to be able to hold Durden down and just completely nullify Durden on his back. And I think when you're looking at the striking, this is where the biggest gap in skill is in this fight because 
Durden's got really good boxing. He's got really good kickboxing. JP Bay, is, his chin, in my opinion, can't be trusted. He gets hurt constantly. He gets drops. He's been knocked out. And I just feel that Durden's going to be able to put that type of striking on JP Bay's to create those moments where he could potentially drop him, rock him, knock him out, and ultimately take over the fight. Bay's, for me, he's got to get his wrestling going early, but I just don't think it's... He's going to be able to take Durden down, in my opinion. But then once the wrestling happens, you're then looking at the grappling and the jiu-jitsu. And I don't think that Baze's jiu-jitsu is world-class enough to be able to completely nullify Durden. Durden's grappling's good as well, good enough to get back up to his feet. So if that's the theme, Baze taking Durden down, Durden standing back up, landing some good strikes, getting taken down again, standing right back up, landing good strikes again, that type of fight is going to favour Durden, not only from a finishing perspective, but from the judge's perspective as well. So for that reason, I'm picking Cody Durden to win this fight. And in the next fight, we've got Mario Batista versus Brian Kelleher. And I think this is a good fight for Batista. He's got a couple of things to watch out for, for sure. Brian Keller does still have sneaky power. Obviously, we saw it last time against Hunter Azure, where he got knocked out cold after Hunter Azure was doing good stuff against Brian Kelleher and ultimately won that first round, was winning the second round, and then got caught and knocked out. So that's something Batista's definitely got to be careful of here, considering he has been knocked out before as well. But the other thing that Batista's got to be careful of also here is the guillotine of Brian Kelleher. I don't think Batista's going to be actively shooting for takedown, so that's going to reduce the likelihood of that guillotine being pulled off and, you know, being successful with. So I do think that Batista's got to be careful there. But even when you look at Brian Kelleher against Ode Osborne, Brian Kelleher actually shot the takedown, and then as Ode Osborne was trying to stand back up, you know, he ended up getting the choke from that stand-up. So that's something that Batista's got to be careful of. Brian Kelleher has done a good job in his last couple of wins of just being relentless, relentless, relentless with the wrestling. The thing is with Batista, he's going to have a speed advantage here, not only with the movement, but with the striking as well. So I think Brian Keller is going to struggle to get into that wrestling range consistently to put on a wrestling heavy performance. Batista's going to be tagging in with the strikes, the quick strikes. And when Brian Keller is coming into range, Batista's going to be able to react quickly as well. But if Batista is taken down, he also scrambles really well, really quick and chaotic scrambler. He's able to get back up to his feet. It's just in those moments, he's got to be careful. His neck doesn't get wrapped up. But outside of that, I think it's a good fight for Batista. I think he's going to rack up volume here. He's going to be the quicker striker, the more cleaner, crisper striker. He's going to rack up more volume. I think his cardio is going to be better. And like I say, unless he gets caught with a flash submission or a flash knockout, I just think Brian Keller is going to be a step behind throughout this fight. So I'm picking Mario Batista to win this fight. And in the final breakdown of this episode of the podcast, we've got Jin Yu Fry versus Vanessa Demopoulos. And I think this is going to be a close fight in spells. Vanessa Demopoulos, I think, has still got to really stamp her ground in, in the UFC. I feel that like she has got holes in her game, both in the striking and the grappling. And Jin Yu Fry is not a perfect fighter either. She's got holes in her game as well, especially at the... The, the level that she's at in the UFC. But I think that from an all-round perspective and a much more calmer fighter, a more relaxed fighter, and the fighter that's more likely going to put a more steady, composed, all-round performance together is Jin Yu Fry. I think Vanessa Demopoulos is absolutely going to have moments in this fight. Like I said, I think it, it's going to be close in parts, but when you are looking for that fighter to just edge the rounds, to just start pulling away, to do that little bit more than her opponent and the fact that Jin Yu Fry is more well-rounded, she is the slightly better striker, she could potentially be the slightly better wrestler, although that's close. Topside grappling, I think she's the more likely fighter to end up topside and I think she would be safe from the armbars and triangles from bottom from Vanessa Demopoulos as well. So with all that put together, I do think it's going to be a close fight. I do think Demopoulos is going to have a moment, but I am picking Jin Yu Fry to pull through and win this fight. And that's all for this episode of On The Money Line for UFC Vegas 57. As always, thank you all for tuning in. Thanks for the likes to the video, the subscriptions to the MMA Play 365 YouTube channel. I really appreciate it. I'm the one that replies in the comments as well. So tell me who you're betting on this weekend. Tell me your predictions, where you think that I've got it wrong. And if you are gambling, if you are betting on Saturday night, then I wish you the best of luck to smash the bookies. But until next time, I'm Newsom. Thanks for listening. We'll see you again next week.